Alice, thank you so much for being here with me today to talk about urethrophobia and your experience and overcoming that. Um, one of the reasons why I wanted to talk to you is because when I started my own journey, I just turned on a camera, started talking to whoever would listen. I didn't even know that this was really a big thing. I just knew there wasn't a lot of information for me out there. And I felt like if I could just start talking to somebody, even if that was just myself on a camera, that maybe that would help me overcome. And then as I started looking more into this term, because I didn't even know that was a term at first. I was just talking about these splotches that I would get on my neck and my chest. And then I found the term erythrophobia. And then I found your videos that you had out there, which had quite some traction on there. I mean, I, one of them I looked at today has 457,000 views and then you have 127,000 oh views. Then you have a 54,000 <laughs> views and a 39,000 views, which seems like small compared to your 457,000, but it's really showing that there is an interest in this topic. People are silently suffering with this and don't know that there's information out there. Um, so I wanted to talk to you a little bit because your channel was not actually about overcoming urethrophobia, what was your YouTube channel created for and about originally? Yes. Yeah, so, well, first of all, I just want to say like, thank you so much for having me and thank you so much for the amazing work that you're doing. I think that the work that you're doing is saving lives. Right. Um, um, yeah. So I originally started my YouTube channel um, because I was going through recovery and um at the time, or eating disorder recovery, I should clarify. Um, and at the time when I was going through recovery, um, I I was looking for people who like had the same struggles in recovery that I did. Um, and I just could not find anyone out there that was talking about the same things that I was dealing with in recovery. And so when I finally, um, when I finally got to a stable place in my recovery, I just like, I felt obligated to share my experience because I don't know, just in case someone else had the same struggles that I did. Um, because yeah, when I was going through recovery, I felt like I was searching through the corners of the internet, like trying to find anyone that was going through the same things that I was going through. Um, and I just could not find anyone. So I thought it would be valuable to share my own experience in case there was someone that was like me that was searching for those answers or just someone to relate to. So that was the original reason why I started my YouTube channel. Yeah. And when you did the first, it's when you got to the place of talking about your experience with chronic blushing, and I, I heard you say in one of the videos, you actually feel like that um, is something that may have contributed to your eating disorder as well. Be, and, and you talked oh, a yeah. lot about like the hypervigilance of how you think about yourself mm. and you think about, and I experienced so much of that and hearing your, your story about how you, um, were, so you had a blushing episode and you, where you fell, mm -hmm. right. You fell in front of the cl oh, yeah. class or something <laughs> and somebody yeah. was like, Oh, look at your face. But that wasn't really your tipping point. It was the yeah. next, I think. Right. No, that's right. Yeah. So um, when like the first, um, the first time that I blushed and felt like embarrassed, I think, yeah, the first time was in grade six, but for some reason that was like more minor, like that didn't really like stick with me. The, the time that like really started this like long, dark path of suffering from erythrophobia was in grade seven. Um, I gave a presentation in health class and I remember sitting back down at my seat and the girl behind me saying, oh my gosh, Alice, your face is so red. And like, I had no idea that um, like my face even had the ability to turn like super red. And so that was kind of like the first time where I realized that my face did have the ability to turn super red. And in that moment, like I felt so much shame and embarrassment. Um, so that was like sort of the, the first point that like started it all. <laughs> yeah. And then it's like this hyper hyper vigilance thing after that. I know, I think at one point you talked yeah. about, like, you even think about what you say, you think about like yeah. everything that's reflecting back to you. And I, and it's almost like an over sensitivity to yourself. And that's oh, very yeah. similar to what happened for me is that I remember one day 
I, mine, mine happened, um, in the environment of being in corporate America. And that for me is just like climbing that ladder, being in that public presence. I never had an issue being public with anybody. And even being younger, I loved like presentations and I used to sing and I would get up in front of people all the time, but it's once I I went into corporate at 18, really young and that environment of judgment and that if you Mm -hmm. perform and look a certain way, you get these these greater benefits because of that and having narcissistic bosses that are are this authoritative power over you. And I, I flushed in front Mm -hmm. of a boss one time and he, he, oh my gosh, are you okay? Like mine is neck and chest. So it looks like an allergic reaction. And, um, he's like, you're super splotchy. And I remember looking down and feeling so small because my ability to look confident was gone in that moment. And then every time he would see me, he could trigger it. And so he would make it happen over and over again. And that's really when it started for me around like 2017, um, or so, but it, uh, the same thing, I remember being in conversation and all of a sudden it's like, I couldn't talk appropriate. Like, I'm like, why can't I use my words anymore? And I couldn't, I was so aware of myself. I was aware of, I, I was holding my breath a lot of times. And I'm Mm -hmm. like, I'm holding my breath. Um, And so that was your trigger was in school that moment. And then um, you, let's see here. You, you talked about how this became so debilitating that you would talk to your parents about it, that you did share Mm -hmm. with your parents about. Yeah. Yeah. So um, yeah, I feel like there's like so much that I want to say that it's like hard to just focus on one thing at a time, but like, um, yeah, I just want to like make a note that like, that's like one of the reasons why I agreed to do this interview and why I feel like it's so important to bring awareness to it because like, you know, you had never suffered from erythrophobia before that person pointed it out. And so, and for me too, like, um, I, it never became an issue for me until like someone pointed it out to me. So I just feel like, you know, it's, it's so important for people to know, like, if you see someone that's blushing, like how important it is to not point out their blushing, because like, you never know the effect that's going to have on that person. Um, but yeah, and then um, just going back to like the, yeah, being like super self-conscious and like hyper vigilant and like paying attention to everything that you're doing and saying, I feel like blushing, like my erythrophobia was sort of like the start of that. So um, because it made me feel so self-conscious, um, and like just humiliated, vulnerable, uh, just so embarrassed. And so, um, yeah, it made me like so hyper aware of like everything that my body was doing. Um, it also like made me feel very out of control of my own body. Um, because, you know, I wanted so desperately to not blush, um, but it felt like I had no control over my body and that my body was like self-sabotaging me, like just, you know, humiliating me involuntarily without my control. And so that was another thing that I think led to my eating disorder was like, I felt so out of control in my own body that like, I was just trying to find ways that I could, yeah, control my body essentially. Um, And then, so yeah, so when I was struggling with it. I, yeah, I did talk to my parents. I talked to my friends. I went to go see, get professional help. Um, but when I was struggling with it, um, I mean, I still to this day, like not many people know what erythrophobia is. They don't realize that this is something they have no idea that that this is something that people struggle with. And so, um, unfortunately, like when I went to like tell my friends about it or tell my parents about it, they just, they just really did not understand the issue and so um it unfortunately just led me to like feeling even more alone even more weird I genuinely thought that I was like the only person that had this issue because I never saw anybody else that blushed and um everyone that I I talked to about it just had no idea what I was talking about um I even remember like, you know, wanting to go, or I went to go see a counselor and different psychologists to try to help me with this issue. But, you know, even a lot of professional, just a lot of professionals just have no idea what erythrophobia is. And so they unfortunately just did not like know how to help me. Um, So that was like my experience with like telling other people about it and, you know, trying to get help with it. 
Yeah. yeah. And, and I, I realized too, like you said, it, I talked to a couple of friends about it once I started. So YouTube is what really helped me start being mm -hmm. vocal. Um, because I really, I remember when one subscriber showed up and I never started my channel to like get monetized and have subscribers. I just wanted to talk, but also have information out there so that if anybody was looking that they might find it and it might help them to know they weren't alone. Mm -hmm. And then I remember like one subscriber two, and people commenting and they were just so grateful to find somebody talking about it because it's such a shame filled thing that a lot of people won't publicly share mm -hmm. it. And so I started, my husband knew about it and his response was very much, you know, I mean, I, I, it's not a big deal. Like for other people around yeah. you, it's not a big deal. And, and then I remember talking to a friend and I was trembling when I told her and she was like, <laughs> I mean, I've seen it before, but I don't really think anything about it. And so I think your point of saying, if you see somebody flushing red, blushing or anything of that nature, do not publicly call that out. <laughs> you know, yeah. that is, um, <laughs> that is a, it really, it, uh, any story I've ever heard, there was a moment and it is usually because somebody publicly humiliated them in that moment, whether they meant to or not by saying, yeah. look at how red you are. And a big yeah. thing for me, especially with like splotches up my neck and chest is, uh, it is genuine concern for me. They think I'm having an allergic reaction and that's yeah, exactly, <laughs> it's like that. So even if you are genuinely concerned about someone and you think maybe they're having an allergic reaction, maybe just pull them to the side and ask them. I mean, it still might yeah. be a moment that could trigger somebody, but it's also, if you truly think somebody is like going to die in front of mm -hmm. you and go into like, uh, anaphylactic shock, <laughs> which is what, what it, with mine, it's been adults. And so adults are usually not teasing. They are besides mm -hmm. that the boss who triggered it. Uh, adults are actually genuinely concerned that something is going on with you. And so even now, like I, yeah. I still will flush now. I don't have erythrophobia anymore. And that's why I was really curious to talk to you because you don't claim to have that, you know, but you talked about like, you may still turn red. And I think it's important for people to know most people that I am interacting with, they just really want a cure. And mm -hmm. for me, I have not found a cure and you can try a product and you even talked about makeup. Um, which for, uh, I love, I love what you shared about makeup, how you kind of discovered it after the fact, but it felt like you could kind of turn that thing off. And that's how I am with high, I wear high neck shirts. So if I'm going to be in a situation where I know I'm most likely going to flush in this situation, I just put on a high neck shirt and it is not about the avoidance. It's about, I don't want to be distracted by it. And I feel so much more confident still, even if I'm not struggling from the phobia, um, mm -hmm. if that is what I have in my wardrobe and I know I'm going to be doing some sort of public speaking thing, I would rather just not have the distraction of it. Um, and I, that was a thing for you when you talked about makeup and foundation and you were caking it on at first and then you were like, yeah. let me back <laughs> off of this a little bit. Yeah. So for me, yeah, I'm the same way in that, like I have cured, I guess, erythrophobia for myself, but I still have the ability to blush, um, but it just happens like so infrequently now because I don't have the fear of it anymore. And yeah, so for me, um, yeah, makeup was not a cure for erythrophobia for me, but it was definitely, I found it to be a very like helpful stepping stone um, to get to a place where I'm no longer a fear, uh, I'm no longer afraid of blushing. Um, so for me, I found that discovering makeup was like using training wheels when learning how to ride a bike. Um, so because it allowed me to like be in situations where I normally would blush, um, but like not having to worry about the other person seeing me blush. So um, like, for example, before in high school or junior high, um, I would just like avoid any attention drawn to me. I would avoid all conversations. If I did end up in a conversation with somebody, I would talk really fast and I would do everything I could to like end the conversation as quickly as possible um, so that I could like run away and hide. <laughs> um, and so blushing or sorry, um, makeup just allowed me to practice being able to be like, in conversations with people and not having to worry about blushing because I knew that if I were to blush, they wouldn't be able to see it anyway. So it was really important in like, it, it helped me to start rewire, to start like rewire my brain um, 
because like before it was like if I was in this situation where that was like a trigger for blushing I would just immediately immediately blush um so anyways yeah it definitely wasn't a cure for me but it was like a great um a great stepping stone for me um in the journey of overcoming erythrophobia. So yeah, I love that yeah. as training wheels. Cause that's, that's the same yeah. thing. Like there, I have a video called how avoidance behaviors helped me because a lot of times from the therapy side of things, they're like, it's an avoidance, it's an avoidance. And I'm like, but I needed those <laughs> avoidance behaviors to know exactly me where I was going. It, exactly. It's, yeah. There's a lot yeah. of different products and things that I've tried because I was mm -hmm. looking for give me something that's going to take it away. Uh, the one thing that did work for me is propranolol, which is a, be a beta blocker, but I didn't want to be on oh, a medic okay. medication full time. So mm -hmm. a doctor prescribed that as needed. And, um, yeah. and it, it definitely helped. I've heard a lot of good things about propranolol for people, but it's still not something I wanted to lean on every single yeah. time. And I haven't used it since 2021. Um, yeah. Yeah. Sometimes like when you're like, if you're, um, if erythrophobia is really affecting your everyday life and, um, like you're just so exhausted from basically being in the fight or flight response every day, sometimes you just need like some sort of immediate relief. So, um, they're not necessarily going to be long-term fixes, but for example, like for me, um, another thing that was really beneficial for me was, um, like temporarily removing myself from the situation that was really triggering my erythrophobia. So for me, um, like, and these things are definitely not things that you want to do, in my opinion, in the long term, um, because like, you don't want to like try to run away from your blushing forever. But like, sometimes if you're just in a place where like, you're just exhausted and um, erythrophobia is really affecting you. Like sometimes those things like makeup or like for you, the medication or um, one thing I did was I, I homeschooled for one year in high school, um, which was just really great uh, to have like that break on my body um, to have like, yeah, just giving my body a chance to like feel safe again for a period of time and just calming my nervous system. Um, um, yeah, so these like things definitely aren't like, they're probably not like long term solutions, they aren't like the cure to erythrophobia. But yeah, sometimes having these like, quick fixes are just really important for your well being. Um, so yeah, yeah. And, and I think what you're saying about environment, I took a note about this from one of your videos where you talked about how you homeschooled and that mm -hmm. just not being in those lights and not being around yeah. the people and how you were able to really regain a lot of your confidence because you were out of mm -hmm. the environment that was triggering. There is yeah. a, a, a woman, her name is Dr. Madeline DeHawk. She did a TEDx talk. I actually interviewed her not too long ago on the channel. Um, she did a TEDx talk this year on how she overcame blushing and uh by using her voice by learning to speak up and say the things that she needed to say and a lot of what her message is about and she's in her 50s like she we had a great conversation about how just how this process went for her and that she will still turn red but what she overcame was the fear of it and what she realized was how important environment was and being able to really feel safe in your environment and i think hearing your story about school and a lot of people who go through that it's traumatizing in school. And for me, it was in the corporate realm and I have worked from, from home, uh, since June. Well, I, I had a baby, so I went on maternity leave, but I've been home, but I still work a corporate job, but I've been home, uh, for, for about two years now. And my body is for the first mm -hmm. time relaxing. I don't flush nearly as much. Um, I can be in more social situations that aren't triggering me because I'm not mm -hmm. in that corporate realm. And even being on zoom calls with my boss who it took about a year for me to stop flushing when we were on a call together, mm -hmm. he has really proven to be such a safe and stable person that the environment, the working from home and having the safety of that authoritative person that, that can say whether I'm going to have a job or not, um, has become so much of a safety, like play a safe place for me that it has, it is rewiring yeah. and rewriting that. So when you talked about going, being homeschooled, being out of the environment that was triggering to you, and you also talked about getting a job that actually forced you into like the public eye, customer service, having to talk yeah. to people, <laughs> but you've shared something I, I found very interesting and, and you 
it, feel free to jump in here and just say whatever you want to say after, after I close, at close this part of the question out, but you talked about how you, you were kind of scripted on what you had to say. And so that actually helped you because you were having to think so much about what you were going to say that you didn't have enough time to think about you. Is that right? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. What I, what I learned was that, um, cause when I, when I was really struggling with erythrophobia, like, um, if I was in a conversation with somebody like, um, it was always when they were talking that I would blush, um, because it was almost like I had more time to like overthink things and start worrying about blushing. But what I found was that when I, like, when I was actually talking and like focusing on what I was saying, um, I would forget about my fear of blushing. I would forget about like the fact that I was worried about blushing. Um, so yeah, I, cause before, like when I was really struggling with it, I, um, I like would avoid talking at all costs. Like I would always want like the other person to be talking so that they were like the focus of attention. But what I learned is that, that yeah, when I actually spoke up and used my own voice, um, yeah, that actually I found, um, allowed me to forget about being afraid of blushing. Um, and yeah, so now I'm forgetting your original question. I'm sorry. I, it was okay. I talked in abstract. I talked about you being kind of oh, forced okay. yeah. in the public eye and also, yeah. um, get, first of all, getting out of the environment that was triggering it. You went back into yeah. that and it triggered it first, no, exactly. but you, yeah. you talked yeah. about posture and holding your shoulders oh, yes. back and not, you know, folding into yourself. Yeah, I feel like there was there was so much that like went into like helping me to overcome erythrophobia. So, um, so yeah, like number one was you know allowing myself to have a break from the environment that was triggering me, um, but also continuing to challenge myself and push myself outside of my comfort zone. So, um, yeah, I got a job um, in the restaurant industry, you know, where you're interacting with customers every single day. And that was like my worst nightmare. Um, and um, <clears throat> excuse me, but doing things that continue to push me outside of my comfort zone um, and almost like faking it until I made it was something that was really beneficial for me. So um, when I like was in school, I would often like have my head down. I would be like doing everything I can to hide my blushing. Um, I'd have closed body, uh, body posture and everything. Um, and as I, so I started getting into personal development because I was trying to like figure out a solution for this and figure out, um, yeah, just how to improve my life and, you know, overcome the fear of blushing. And, uh, one of the things that I learned was that, um, like just the, the importance of having like a confident body posture, like body language. So even if I just felt like so scared, not confident whatsoever, I would almost like be able to trick my brain into thinking that I was confident when like maybe I wasn't at all. So even if I really wanted to like put my head down, I wanted to like, I don't know, cross my arms or something, I would um, force myself to like have good posture, head up, um, and like have the body, have the body posture or the body language of someone that is confident, um, which like almost like tricked my brain into thinking that I really was confident. <laughs> so that was another thing that helped me with my blushing was, um, yeah, pushing myself outside of my comfort zone and faking it until I made it basically. <laughs> and I think too, that's one thing that I really loved about your story about among other great things of your story, but you were being so open and real and honest about how difficult it was, but you also were willing to put yourself in really uncomfortable situations to get back out there. Mm -hmm. Because I, I think for a lot of people, what erythrophobia does is it starts to shut you down. It's I've had yeah. people reach out to me who say they, they never come out of the house. They yeah. are literal, they're literally dying in a corner and they're not happy yeah. there either. So if you think about, I don't want to be public and I don't want people to see me and I don't want to have this condition in front of people, but I'm also not satisfied if I'm, if I'm wilting behind the scenes, because I do believe yeah. you know, my life was made for so much more than that. And, mm -hmm. uh, so one, one major theme that I see in your story is that you continuously 
put yourself back out there, even if you needed a break, even if you took some time away, but, but do you feel like it was for you that it was like, I, my alternative of just like shriveling away is not an option or what kind of pushed you to keep doing those uncomfortable things? Yeah. So it certainly wasn't always like that for me. Like, um, for several years, I was in a really, really dark place, um, mentally, and I was, you know, completely isolating myself. Um, uh, like, you know, I was just so afraid to basically leave the house. I did not want to go to school. I like wouldn't talk to like literally anyone except for my family and like closest friend. Um, but eventually I got to a place of realizing that, um, I can either be uncomfortable, like trying to hide from my blushing, running away from my blushing, um, or I can be uncomfortable and face my blushing and do things that are challenging, um, and start to work on my personal development and like actually like actively try to, yeah, face my blushing and accept it. So you can be uncomfortable either way, but one way is just going to get you farther than the other way essentially so yeah so yeah eventually I realized yeah it eventually I realized um yeah just things this was not clearly what I was doing was not working for me like trying to hide from my blushing and running away from it was not working um so it was yeah I had to change something and I had to start um pushing myself and putting myself in uncomfortable situations in order to grow and start to overcome this. So yeah, it's kind of like pick your poison, you know, do you want the discomfort of uh, isolating and suffering from it? Or do you want the discomfort of trying to push through it? And I think, I think that's huge for people to know because recently I was on live TV and uh, twice. So as a person who has chronic flushing, I, it was interesting because I've been on this journey, public journey for about three years now on YouTube, but it's been about five years overall since I've been kind of traveling down this road of trying to figure out like, what is this? What can I do to cure it? And I have had multiple tests done and talked to doctors and, you know, dermatologists and and nobody, like you said, there's really not a lot of information. So no one really has concrete information or guidance. Um, so what I started doing was similar to you was just put myself in an uncomfortable situation. And then after about a year and a half of being on the channel, I started talking more and sharing with people in my, my sphere that I have the channel. Now I'm very public with the fact that I have this channel but it it kind of turned, it reframed it from this thing that I was suffering from to this thing that I now use to help other people. So it gives me an exposure opportunity, but it also allows me to give a voice to people that feel that they are voiceless or to have the opportunity to talk to people like yourself, who you are so much more than, than blushing. And that's part of what we're going to talk about a little bit later on is to not only have people share about how they've overcome the discomfort or that maybe they're still uncomfortable, but they don't fear it. It doesn't stop them from living their life to know that that's normal. You don't have to just go from one extreme to the other, but also, like you said, you're in a dark period of your life for a while. And then you Mm -hmm. started to move into this like acceptance and moving through it. Um, but I was on live TV recently. And one of the things I did a vlog on this, that I did the interview on the news. It was about, I just had a book release, um, not about blushing, but about uh, my dad's cancer journey. And I, you would think Alice that I would have been just so fully, I didn't flush at all. And I told, um, I did an interview with this guy named Hank Thurman, um, recently. And I told to him, I said, I actually felt so alive and he, and I, I'm thinking, because this is my thing, you know, this is what I was made for. And he made a very interesting comment. He said, I wonder if it's because you were actually fully present Because when you're in an interview and you don't know what's about to be asked of you and you're on live TV and the pressure's there and you have like four minutes, you can't be anywhere else but right there in that moment. And maybe it wasn't the fact that I was on live TV and this public broadcast that I felt alive, but it's because I was actually for the first time really present. And I, I've really been chewing on that for the past couple of weeks since he said that. Um, But it definitely made me think about 
when you talked about being scripted in that job and you had to think about what you were going to say next, that you didn't have time to think about you. And uh, very similar to what you were saying in regards to when people are talking, you have time to think, but when you are just Mm -hmm. fully in the moment and you're talking, you don't have time to think about what the response is or what somebody's thinking or what your body's doing. And I I just found that that those similarity is very interesting. And then I was on live TV again, because I had so much fun that I got on a another opportunity (laughs) actually this past Monday. And I was telling my husband, I go, they're actually preparing me. This was actually like a TV show, like a lifestyle TV show. Uh, they're preparing me so much that I'm actually getting more nervous by knowing so much than I would be if I just like go live and let's just go. Like right. I knew the questions they were going to ask. I knew like there was um, uh, directors that were coming out and talking to me that I was it, actually getting more nervous. But again, I didn't flush at all while I was on live TV. Yeah, And Amazing. I think it has to do with being present and not being so hyper fixated on, am I going to do it right? Am I going to do it wrong? Like you're live it's go time. Like let's do it. And, and it also, it really reinforced in me that I can trust myself. I can trust because when we have this condition, like you said, your body feels so out of control and you Mm -hmm. can't make it stop. So it makes you feel out of control. Um, and you've been able to carry on living your life, doing your thing. Um, I know that you've, uh, you have a successful YouTube channel that you created that you, um, definitely got some, some, um, some good feedback there from people in regards to sharing about your story. What do you think is the most impactful thing for you after sharing your story about your phobia or your eating disorder or anything that just from the response around you, that was really surprising to you? Oh, I feel like there's so many things, but I would say like the uh, well, the thing that comes to mind right now that had a really big impact on me was just realizing how many people had the exact same struggles that I had um, before I posted about my, like either my eating disorder or about erythrophobia. Like I genuinely thought that I was the only person um, that had these struggles. Like even before I made my erythrophobia video, I don't even remember what originally motivated me to like make that first video on erythrophobia, but I was like genuinely so, so shocked by like the response of that video because before I posted that video, I, I genuinely thought that I was like the only person that struggled with it. And it's just amazing how like still to this day, I get comments almost every single day on one of my erythrophobia videos um, from people like sharing their own experience and like how similar it was to mine. Um, And it was through posting that um, the first video that someone introduced me to a Facebook group called the I blush Facebook group. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with Mm -hmm. that group, but, um, and then joining that group and then like realizing, you know, having everyone in there share their experience with it. It was just like, um, yeah, just so amazing to just, you know, see that so many people like, yeah, struggle with the exact same things that you're struggling with. So like, even if you're feeling so alone with um, struggling with something, just like having that comfort of knowing that you're not the only person struggling with this, um, that was actually like, yeah, that was really helpful for me, but also like really mind blowing for me, just like, yeah, seeing that I wasn't alone, and um yeah i just also wanted to like point out i just yeah it's it's so cool that you went on this is kind of off topic but going back to what you were saying before about how like going on live tv um it just goes to show you like even if you struggle with erythrophobia like how far you can go like um even if you're in a place where you know things feel so dark it might seem like so hopeless for you um like just doing this interview today for me is like huge for me because my past self would never imagine that I could do an interview with someone like without like the control of being able to like edit it afterwards. So I don't know if that was your experience doing live TV. Like, I don't, did you always, was there a, a time where like you thought like you would never be able to go on live TV or like, have you always like had that confidence to be able to do something like that. I'm just curious. Yeah. Well, I think for me, because I was much into entertainment when I was younger and once urethrophobia 
became a part of my life. Uh, a big thing for me was I got to get back to who I was before this, but I couldn't get the redness to go away. And so then, mm -hmm. you know, how do I operate with it? And that's what really helped me overcome the actual fear of blushing, of getting to this place of like, I don't care. Like I care, but I don't, it's not going to stop yeah. my life because I, like you said, I'd rather be in the discomfort of letting someone see it and educating them on it. And maybe potentially one day it going away because I just don't care anymore because I believe yeah. it's there because I care so much about it. And my body is having that trauma response to something in the environment. Um, mm -hmm. So for me, it was this huge moment of stepping out into the public eye. And honestly, I think from just so much healing that's happened over the past three years through the YouTube channel and from connecting with others, like you said, people just reaching out to you and letting you know, and, and knowing that like so many people deal with this, that it's not just me, that it was kind of an afterthought, but I know that it, the reason why I vlogged it and the reason why I, I even went live at one point um, on YouTube to show the Blushing Phoenix community that we can do oh. the hard things. So yeah. I think for me, yeah. it's like the, the stage has always been a dream of mine and I let myself wilt and hide for so long that I felt like this was yeah. a returning of myself or returning to myself totally. that even if I have these like battle wounds and these and this visual that may come along with me it's an opportunity to to speak to it instead of letting it take my voice away so but yeah I it was a that. huge moment after everything I've been yeah. through um in in letting that be seen it that the opportunity was there for it to happen and if it showed up then it was part of me and it wasn't something I wanted to keep hidden anymore that's so cool. I love that. Yeah. Um, yeah, I know that I told you this before, like the interview, but um, I, I wanted to say it again, just in case like anybody else, like maybe has the same struggles that, you know, I've struggled with, but like, so for, for me with struggling with erythrophobia, um, one of the side effects of having erythrophobia for me was I, didn't develop my communication skills or my social skills. And so even when I overcame erythrophobia, I was still dealing with the after effects uh, or the side effects of struggling with erythrophobia for so long. And for me, that was, um, yeah, just not, not being able to articulate my thoughts into words, feeling really self-conscious in any social situation, because I always found myself stumbling over my words and um it was because I had like spent I had spent like you know so many years of my life in like basically isolation and hiding from people and not talking to people that when I was finally overcoming this and like finally starting to communicate with people again um I found it such a struggle just being being articulate and so I never thought that I'd be able to do an interview like this um because I just thought I was going to make an absolute fool of myself and humiliate myself um, because, um, yeah, I just had such a hard time like organizing my thoughts and I still do to this day. But um, this is a really big milestone for me because um, I like, I finally feel like I'm at a place where I can possibly like, do an interview without absolutely making a fool of myself. Um, so I just wanted to like, send that message out there because as I've as we talked about as I've learned is that like if you're struggling with something somebody else is probably having the same struggle so um if there's anyone out there that is struggling with erythrophobia and because of that is really struggling with their communication skills just know that you can get to a place where you are confident with your communication again and where you'd be able to do something as scary as like maybe going on live tv or doing a presentation or doing an interview or like talking to a group of people at once um that was just one message that i really wanted to share because like that is just something that like so um like just has been such a uh it just really negatively affect affected me in my life and i didn't know that there was like any hope for me to get better and um, there is, and I just want people to know that there is hope, um, and things can get a thousand times better. And you're proof of that by showing up here. How do you feel now that you're like in the thick of the interview? Like, do you, how are you no, feeling about everything? It's great. <laughs> yeah. It's like terrifying, but it's also like almost <laughs> exhilarating. It's so exciting. Yeah. And it's and, like um, you said, it's yeah. like a, it's the growth opportunity too, especially the thing that maybe you're like, oh, I don't know. Because even you talking about like being able to organize your thought, I'm like, 
you are so concise to me. Like you are so clear. Oh, you gosh. speak so well that if you weren't sharing well, that, I would have never known you were struggling to, to, so, to be, to get in this situation because of that fear. Yeah. That's amazing to hear you say that because I, <laughs> yeah, I never thought that I would be sitting here and I never, uh, it's just such a big compliment for me. If someone tells me that I'm articulate, because like, that's something that I'm so, self-conscious of or, or that I was like so self-conscious of and yeah so thank you for saying that I appreciate it <laughs> of course and um thank you I'm, I'm gonna wrap up this segment of uh for blushing phoenix blushing phoenix folks we're going to also be on the april pointer podcast with some other additional things with alice and some of the other things that she does outside of overcoming erythrophobia <laughs> because there's so much more to her than that so alice <laughs> thank you so much for uh taking the time to be here and i will link your youtube in the description box below so that people can find you uh uh, are you on any other social media platforms or websites? Um, I'm on Instagram, but um, I, I don't post a lot about erythrophobia on Instagram. But if you do, like, if you want to message me, if you have any questions at all, um, uh, you can follow or check me out at Irene Creative Studio on Instagram. Okay. So, and I'll yeah. link that below as well. Thank you Sounds so good. much, Alice. Thank, thank you so much for having me. And thank you so much for all the work that you do on this channel. You're doing very important work. So thank, thank you. you.